Hello, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Sandy Rosenthal, and I'm host of the podcast, Beat the Big Guys. Today, my guest comes from the great state of Louisiana, where I'm also from, but he is from the city of Gonzales, and his name is Stephen Estopanov. Hello, Stephen. Hey, how you doing, Sandy? You know, the first time we met each other was at the flood authority. And that's that was our first uh, contact with each other. So glad to see you again. You're looking very good. Oh my, well, thank you so much. Um, the, even though this is a, an audio podcast, um, the listeners may be glad to know that we also put a copy of this episode on Zoom. So there are always somebody out there that would prefer to watch an interview than just listen to it. That's so, right. So yes, um, we 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 did meet on the Flood Authority. Um, Mr. Stopanol is also a civil engineer, and I, as many of you know, I'm a civil civic activist. But we but we were friends though. Oh, absolutely. I am. And matter of fact, we wound up on the same side of many issues. But uh, uh, yeah, we, I, I consider us good friends. I do too, and it's it's wonderful to have you with us today because there's a side of uh, Mr. Stopanol. Of course, it's okay if I call she's called you Stephen. Oh, I prefer it. If you prefer it, and that there was a side of the civil engineer that I knew. And it turned up he was a novelist, and and not just novels, but historical novels with a with a with a very very interesting. Um, truth and passion, which I'm getting ready to tell you all about. But first, let me introduce my guest today. Stephen Estopanol was born in Roswell, New Mexico, but grew up in the swamps and bayous of Louisiana. He is a graduate of Louisiana State University and a U.S. Army veteran, and as we've already mentioned, a civil engineer. Mr. Estopanol's novels are historical fictions of the eight. 18th century Canary Islander settlers in Louisiana and Texas. Stephen is a descendant of Canary Islanders, Islenos, transported to Louisiana by the Spanish during the American Revolution. He draws on extensive research as well as family oral history to tell his stories of colonial Louisiana from a Spanish point of view. And I have read one of those books. It's my understanding it was the first book. Isn't that right? Uh, yes, yeah, uh, chronologically, yeah. The um, Escape to New Orleans. And I have got to tell my listeners that it grabbed me from page one and kept me all the way to the very end. So not only did I learn a lot of very important information that I didn't know before that, it was really um Interesting. I mean, I it was a page turner, for lack of a better word. I highly recommend it. Uh, thank you very much. I, I enjoy hearing people enjoying my books. That's why I write books, so people can enjoy them. I think that's the best reason. So um, I'm going to go ahead and um, turn the mic over to you. And I, I'm hoping uh, that you wouldn't mind sharing, you know, what, why you thought it was imperative that these books be be written be written for us all. Well, it, uh, the most important thing is, I love in my business when I worked. I I found out a lot of history research and property records, and a lot of the things I discovered surprised me because they were different than my preconceived notions of how things might have been back in such and such a period of time. And this got me interested in first of all living history, and I was very active with the uh, Park Service in Chalmette with the Battle of New Orleans. And because I got interested in that living history, I decided, well, you know, I'd like to tell this story to everybody, but I need to tell it in a way that they'll enjoy it. And, and, and when they read, they'll, they'll learn because they're having fun reading a very good story. And so uh, I, I find periods of history where the general big picture concept is somewhat contrary to what you find out really happened when you dig down, get in the weeds, do research on original paperwork, do research on guys that have uh, studied the history from somewhere other than uh, the, the New York Times. I mean, you get you get some a different point of view from a different angle, and 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 it allowed me to discover a lot of the why things happened and and help me understand better why the world reacts in the way it does. And so that's why I started writing these books. And, and one part of history that 
I think we want to talk about today is the my book Beneath the Bonnie Blue Flag, which contrary to everybody's perception, is not a Civil War book. The Bonnie Blue Flag pre-existed in South uh, Mississippi and West Florida, the Florida parishes in Louisiana, during the West Florida Revolution, which was 1810. And then later in the Civil War, they just took that Bonnie Blue flag back out. And what I found in researching that was the underlying cause of the West Florida Revolution and why things eventually wound up the way they were. And it was really contrary to what you hear when you go on these tours and they say, you know, the West Florida Revolution was, was the first revolution against uh, foreign government uh, uh, after the American Revolution, things like that, which technically it was, but it was much more complex than that. And so uh, I wrote the book following a character that experiences these things so that the reader can get an idea that it wasn't just cut and dry. It, it wasn't one group of people throwing off an oppressive government because at that time, Spain was not an oppressive government. Spain was uh, uh, destitute. They, Napoleon had invaded Spain. The, the king had been kicked off the throne and, the, and a Bonaparte sat on the throne and Spain lost control of all its uh, colonies in, in the Americas one of which was West Florida and East, and East Florida. So they weren't taxing the people. They weren't causing any oppressive government at all. But there were underlying reasons. And, and one of the underlying reasons was that the people in West Florida wanted to impose their kind of government. They wanted to be in charge of it so they could take all the lands of East and West Florida and divvy it among themselves and make gigantic plantations, import a billion slaves and just clear all the land out. Uh, and that was their intention. Didn't work out that way, but uh, when you do the research, you find out it was not an overthrow of a foreign government. It was a, an attempt to seize land by a small group of very rich and very powerful people. And, and, that, and it was, it was, that result was avoided because first of all, they couldn't conquer East Florida he thought it wouldn't have anything to do with it. And Claiborne came in with the U.S. Army and said, no, West Florida was, was part of the Louisiana Purchase, and that ended the whole shebang. So the government lasted 75 days, something like that. It's a, it's a very interesting time. And, mm -hmm. then, and in my book, I like to go into how scientifically and how deliberately uh, the Spanish government set about establishing homesteads and settlers. They had a they had a system that was specifically designed to have families establish family farms, which was different than uh, the colonial system everywhere else where a guy could come in and buy up thousands of acres, then buy a bunch of people and come in and clear those thousands of acres. Couldn't do that with the Spanish because they wouldn't sell you the thousands of acres. You could only get enough for a family for a homestead, uh, about 800 orphans, which is about, I would say, 700 acres. Uh, and that was contrary to what the West Florida wanted to do. They wanted, they wanted to make money. They wanted to get big. They wanted to get rich. And that was more of the impetus than anything else. And that surprised me very much. So you're saying that um, contrary to this belief that, that I have to admit, um, I, I was believe, believing that as well. Um, contrary to what I thought, Spain was not um, oppressive. Um, they didn't even charge taxes, and they also were not um, uh, pushing for slavery. No, I, actually, uh, Spain had, uh, had abolished slavery. Had abolished only, slavery. Yeah, the only reason why they had slavery in Louisiana was because when Spain received Louisiana from France, the treaty said they had to keep the French Code Noir, the French Black Laws, so that, uh, so that the, the big landowners that had slaves wouldn't have to be relieved of 85 percent of their wealth you know, they, these plantation owners they were they were wealthier than some kings in europe but their money was tied up in people and if you let those people go they were destitute they had nothing left but the little independent farmers where they were farming their own land with their family uh 
their wealth was tied up in land and cattle and 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 property. So it was it was a very the very convoluted condition. It was it's it's uh, hard to understand how that could be, but that's how it was. Yeah, I don't think you're going to find many people in the world today that are pro-slavery, but one of the things that you don't, um, but, but most people don't understand is the um, sl slaves was an enormous investment um, yeah. in money and capital. And and and, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm here listening to your point. Once it was abolished, it, 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 it um, the finan financially caused destitution. Um, again, it's just it's just a, a a financial fact that most people right. aren't. It, it, it's just how it was. It's just how it and, was. Right. And, and good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, right. Slavery, slavery goes on across the world today. I mean, I'm uh, afraid so. In Africa, uh, India, China. I mean, if the the Chinese labor is, is <laughs> essentially a slave, uh, and and so it was defended by the people that were prospering from it. The people that didn't have any slaves, they were like, I, well, I don't care one way or the other. But uh, the only people that really were uh, being abused by it were, of course, the, the enslaved people. And, and they weren't happy about that condition at all. Of course, of course. And, when, and when Spain declared uh, abandon, uh, abolished slavery, you had slaves leaving uh, the Americas to go to uh, East Florida uh, and, and join the Seminoles and all those uh, for a brief period of time. Uh, you also, during that pre-confusion, when uh, the United States took over uh, Louisiana from Spain, you had a lot of slaves leaving Louisiana and going to Texas because Texas was controlled by Spain and then later Mexico, both governments of which had abolished slavery. So that's why if you go to Texas and you talk about the cowboys, there were a lot of, a lot of cowboys of African heritage right. because they had escaped and come to uh, areas where slavery was abolished. And it's fairly it's well known here that in New Orleans, we had a huge population, a large right. population of, they were called people of color. Right, free people time. of color. Uh, free and, people yeah. of color. Yeah, and that was a direct result of, of Spain's operation of the French law. Spain worked in a way that, that, first of all, allowed enslaved people to work one day a week for themselves, and also allowed them to then buy their own freedom. And if, if, the, if they had enough money to buy their freedom, in other words, their value as a slave, and their master wouldn't let them go, they could go to a court, and the court would order the sale take place. The result of this was a great uh, rise in free people of color in the New Orleans area uh, because of the implementation of the Spanish law. This was one of the other things that the West Florida Big wigs, the big powerful people in West Florida didn't like because they'll they buy a slave and they train him up real good and soon enough, all of a sudden he's got enough money to buy himself and boom, he they don't control him anymore. He's a free man and and that was upsetting to uh, to some of these. So it was it was a very strange economic arrangement uh, and and if you know historians like to say if they did this or if they did that what. Well, that's kind of silly because you never know what would happen if something else were done. You just, it, it's an, it's an, it's something impossible to know. Uh, but one has to wonder if uh, Napoleon hadn't gotten in, gotten into Spain and caused that Spanish empire to break up, what would have happened in all these other countries when, when, uh, they had laws where slavery was abolished and, 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 uh, Trade was open between all these. It, it just, you just wonder. Uh, and, and so that's why I enjoy writing these books, because then I, I run across these little jewels of information, verify it from different sources to where I'm pretty sure I, I think that's what happened, or at least that's what happened in this particular case. And then I incorporate that in the story so that my reader, going through it, can have that factoid come to him as part of the, as part of the, uh, of the, of the story. What I love about having read your book, Escape from New Orleans, it opened my eyes about the, the Canary Islanders influence. And so now whenever I 
not maybe every day, but often if I hear of a story or hear of an event going on, I have new information in my head that I didn't have before. So I look at current events a little differently. Now, um, Stephen, I, um, I think you mentioned something happened recently. There's some sort of celebration going on in Florida right now. Oh, well, uh, Florida and Pensacola, uh -huh. uh, uh, the people in Pensacola have done an excellent job of maintaining their history. And of course, Pensacola has a very, very long history of uh, Spanish control, Spanish regulation. Uh, and so they have every year, they have uh, events reenacting uh, 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 Pensacola and then sometimes Pensacola being turned over to uh, the United States. And that was, uh, I think, 1810 or somewhere around there. Uh, and so they do a real good job of tracking it. But the biggest thing in Pensacola, and I think it ought to be in New Orleans too, is uh, General Galvez during the American Revolution. He was the governor of Louisiana, and he was the commanding general of the Spanish army. And he was the one that drove the British out of Baton Rouge, out of Mobile, out of Pensacola. He was the one that secured the Mississippi River Valley. He was the one that kept the uh, British out of St. Louis, Missouri, because his soldiers went up there and defended St. Louis. If there's any body that's really great in the history of New Orleans is General Galvez, yeah. without a doubt. That's a big, I, big deal. Yes, it's a real big deal. And Pensacola recognizes that. And I wish uh, Louisiana would do a better yeah. job of recognizing it, particularly when the Battle of Baton Rouge took place in 1779 on September 21st. That was a real battle. It was a battle of the American Revolution. They had American soldiers along with the, uh, the Spanish soldiers. So, and when we say and when we say Spanish soldiers, don't think that all the soldiers in the Spanish army were from Spain. Most of them were not. They had they had recruited locally. So when I go through the rosters for the Spanish army under Galvez, I run across Landry, <laughs> Bourgeois, you know, yeah. and uh, O'Neill, <laughs> O'Neill. <laughs> Yeah. That's uh, not Foss, Foss, I mean, it's it's all <laughs> kinds of different people because they re recruited uh, locally. Right. Okay, thanks so for pointing that out. Locally. So we have, before I forget, we have a major street named Galvez, don't we, here in yeah, New Orleans? And you really ought to. Is, is that, I thought we did have a street, Galvez Street. Oh, yeah, there's a Galvez Street, and, and there, there's also the Galvez uh, statue in downtown New Orleans. But Galvez was, uh, he was the one that really... Uh, it really pushed to have the Spanish version of the French uh, Cour Noir. He was the one that really pushed to see that enslaved people could buy their own freedom. And uh, but, he was the one that personally freed a lot of uh, really. Enslaved. So the so, street that's, that, that's named Galvez in New Orleans, that's the right Galvez? Yeah, that's him. That's the right one. Okay, that's so right and now one. I know. Bernardo, yeah, Bernardo D. Galvez, that's the guy. That's the guy. Uh, he it, was he was the most successful general in the American Revolution. He was never defeated. I had no idea. So um, if if uh, you must have, I'm I'm sure you've got a list of twenty peeves that you you think history is not being properly presented to youngsters in schools right now or, 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 or everyday people. Um, but what are the top one or two peeves, if you will? Oh. Uh, well, the, the, my number one peeve okay. is, is, what, is what's called the Black Legend. And the Black Legend has to do with a propaganda uh, campaign that Britain went on uh, starting in about the middle of the 1700s and all the way up to the American Revolution. And it continued on in America. And that campaign was... Uh, to paint the Spanish as, as uh, uh, murderers, uh, criminals, horrible people. Uh, they, they killed all kinds of... The one thing I hear a lot is that Cortez slaughtered the Aztecs. I mean, you hear that all the time. Yeah, well, yes. Eh, <laughs> not really. Uh, when, Gal when Cortez landed, the Aztecs had subjugated all the tribes around them and was eating them. Yes, the Aztecs were cannibals. And one of the things they like to do is eat their enemies. And uh, so these tribes that were around uh, united with Cortez to conquer the Aztecs. 
the thing that really decimated the Native Americans was the introduction, introduction of smallpox. Smallpox had, had been a, a there, there was a smallpox epidemic in Spain that devastated the Spanish population, and they carried that unknowingly into the Americas. But the, mm -hmm. the plan, the plan that Queen Isabella had and, and King Ferdinand was that their soldiers would marry into the aristocracy of the Native Americans and set up a Spanish people, and they would be part of Spain's domain. And the uh, the fact that smallpox was so terrible, and and it wiped out a mm -hmm. lot of the native population. Yeah. But if you go to awesome. South America today, you run across people that are Native American. I, mean, I understand smallpox they, like a forty percent fatality. Oh, it was horrible. It was yeah. and it was even awesome. higher fatality rate among the Native Americans. Yeah, forty percent fatality rate among Europeans. Yeah, when you got to somebody whose population was never exposed to it, it was. Terrible. Was, yeah. But uh, but to this day, uh, people in South America speak Spanish. But if you look at them, a lot of them have a lot of Native American mm -hmm. heritage. Mm -hmm. And in some places, they don't even speak Spanish anymore. They speak the Native American, uh, right. the Native American language. Right. And that's because the Spaniards didn't didn't conquest in the sense of taking over everything and killing everybody. They wanted to move in. They wanted to get the riches, of course. That had, you know, they were they were in there for the gold, but they were also in there for the people, for the souls, because they wanted to have as many people converted to Catholicism mm -hmm. and become Spaniards. Right. To give you an idea how accepting they were, one of the generals of Galvez at the Battle of Pensacola, his mother was an Aztec princess. Mm -hmm. was, he was only half European, oh. but he was a general. Yeah. So, so that's so my pet peeve. And that I've I've got it, and and let me guess. I hope I'm not off too far off base. Is your series of books what you're doing to to address what your pet peeve is? Well, in a, in a way, uh -huh. but what I'm doing is I'm I'm introducing characters that are people, mm -hmm. real real people, and they're not wild animals, and they're not they're not there for vengeance or money or anything. They're going through like everybody goes through their lives, trying to make it from the cradle to the grave without hurting as many people as you don't have to. I mean, it's and and that's what in these books, these are just people trying to get by in, in a very difficult situation sometimes. So beneath the Bonnie Blue Flag, which is um, w which number after the first book? So I've read um, Escape from New Orleans. Well, the Bonnie Blue Flag is number nine. Number nine. Okay. Yes, yes. So there's uh, seven between, between yeah, but, them. But they, they jump around in time spans. I see. In other words, uh, you, could, you could go as late as the 1930s. Uh, I have uh, a solitario bootlegging on the bayou, which is takes place in the 1930s. takes place in New Orleans, of course. I mean, where else could you be in the 1930s but, but New Orleans? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so... The Bonnie Blue Flag takes place in 1810, and these books take place at different times. But all the, the characters, the main characters in the book, all come back to this one Spanish family that came from the Canary Islands uh, in 1778. And it's pronounced how? Emilia. I think it's just beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Now, so Emilia is a is a town in Spain. It's on the it's on the north. It's on the south coast of. of uh, the Mediterranean Sea in Africa, but it's a Spanish town. And Which three books would you um, most rec most highly recommend um, if for our listeners who are just itching to know more about the Black Legend and, oh, wow. and the things that you've the uh, the three books of your that, books, I mean, yeah, the three of my books that I, that I think will really get you into the mood is Escape to New Orleans. Then Mobile Must Fall, and then Pensacola Burning. Those three together uh, follow that uh, the main protagonist, but it really gets you into the sense of um, how how these how the Spaniards were just as much a European as anybody else, and and that would that contest the the black language the black legend. 
And yes, the first book is Escape to New Orleans. That's right. That's they right. didn't run from it. They ran to it. And and again, Stephen Estopanel is a storyteller. He, he When he tells a story, it is fascinating and interesting. So not only are you learning you know, about important details of our history that everyone should know, you're getting entertained. You know, what's not to like? Stephen, exactly. is there anything else that you'd like to um, share with our listeners who um, some of them may be in a similar situation as you feel you are, as you are, uh, that there's a narrative out there that just falls and, and they wish there was something they could do. What yeah. do you suggest for our listeners? Well, the, the first thing is uh, do some research, really look for uh, original source material, um, uh, diaries, uh, Newspaper accounts are kind of iffy because the newspaper is about one step below uh, above uh, gossip. But uh, those kinds of information. Also, look in other languages. In other words, don't just get the English language history book. Look for some of the ones that are in Spanish. I have to get the English translation because I'm ignorant in any other language but English, and I'm not too good in English. <laughs> anyway... Uh, get those different points of views from different places and it'll surprise you a little bit and then maybe you'll be able to discover well what I thought all along wasn't like that or maybe yeah what I thought all along was really like that I mean it, you, you don't know what you're going to find when you get it's like genealogy you go back and you find that great great grandparent and then when you find out what he really did it might not be as much a surprise as you think <laughs> You've got a good sense of humor. And on that note, uh, thank you so much, Stephen Estopanol, for joining us today. Well, Sandy, thank you so much for inviting me and having the patience to listen to. You're welcome. And for all of you out there in listener land, thank you for joining us. I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. Please be sure to write, rate, please be sure to rate, subscribe, and like this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you too can beat the big guys. Okay, Stephen, stay with me. I'm oh, just going to stop recording.